And my pleasure now to announce the last speaker of the session, not because it is the last speaker, but because it is a very interesting topic. Um, so it's Björn Hückberg from uh, the Karolinska Institute, which will substitute the speaker uh, mentioned in the program. But the topic stays the same, and that is uh, DNA origami. So we are looking very much forward to your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thanks so much for the invitation and uh, for this opportunity to present to this amazing audience here. Uh, so my work is mainly concerned with the problem of how do we control matter at the nanoscale and how can we position uh, molecules and drug molecules, for example, at specific nanoscale intervals from each other, for example, to, do, to aid uh, patients or, or medical research. And there exists today actually uh, some amazing tools and methods that allow us to do exactly this. So over the last few years, DNA nanotechnology and DNA origami, represented here by these uh, 70 nanometer in diameter smileys made by DNA, has given us unprecedented control of matter at the nanoscale. And in my talk today, I will try to convince you that not only can we make pretty looking shapes like these ones, but we're also beginning to see more and more of these types of, of structures being put to use in medical applications. So in particular, I will introduce you our method of delivering the anti-cancer drug doxorubicin using DNA origami. But before I jump into the details of my work, I want to take a brief look at what some other people have been doing using DNA for delivery of drugs, signaling molecules, and antisense therapy. So DNA nanotechnology has actually been used for quite a number of medical applications, uh, uh, not in in, in, the, in clinical studies yet, I think, but unfortunately I've only had time to show you a couple of examples. So in 2011, Bermudas and co-workers, they used a small DNA tetrahedron displaying a loop of antisense DNA. And this way of delivering antisense DNA was more stable to degradation than just using standard, uh, so this is the antisense DNA here, than just using standard linear DNA in a C2, C12 myoblast cell line study. And then Lee et al. from Daniel Anderson's lab at MIT or, uh, yeah, used a similar setup but focused on delivering siRNA attached to their tetrahedra. In this study, they also incorporated folic acid at several sites uh, in their structures to, uh, uh, to acting as a tumor, uh, tumor targeting ligand. And using this delivery system, they were able to obtain over 50% reduction in firefly reciferase expression in HeLa cells, and also a 60% reduction in bioluminescence intensity in a mouse model using luciferase expressing xenografts. Okay, so simple double-stranded DNA has actually also been used for delivery. So in 2009, Balgacott and coworkers, they used plasmid DNA, so this is just a bunch, just take DNA from the, the producing bacteria, and they preloaded that with doxorubicin uh, to test delivery in a xenograft model. And in the case of free doxorubicin, the side effects were more severe, uh, as can be seen from this body weight curve here, and this is the therapeutic effect. So as I said, this was a study in mice using only just double-stranded DNA, so no nanostructures. So when I saw this, I was, of course, thinking, okay, great, but couldn't we do even better using nanostructured DNA? So with all the possibilities given to us by DNA nanotechnology to pattern stuff and to position targeting ligands, etc., shouldn't we be able to do even better using DNA origami? So in my lab, we took the approach of uh, creating DNA origami structures like, like this one, like this rod-like shape here, and then loading them with doxorubicin and then study cell uptake. But before I show you more of this, I just briefly want to go through the basics of how we build these structures. How can you build these types of, of rods using the method of DNA origami? So DNA origami works by taking one long single-stranded DNA scaffold, we call that the, this is one long single-stranded DNA molecule, we call that the scaffold, and then mixing that with a bunch of short single-stranded DNA oligonucleotides. These are usually like 40 bases long. And the, uh, we call these staples. And uh, these are always oligos that we buy, synthetic oligos. And the long DNA molecule, we call that the scaffold, as I said, and this is almost always clonal DNA from, usually from a single-stranded DNA bacteriophage virus, because that's an easy way to produce it. 
And let's assume that we design the yellow oligonucleotide so that it, so that these regions here will hybridize to different parts of the scaffold molecule. So when we mix these two together, uh, the yellow oligonucleotide will bind these parts together or staple them together like that. And let's do the same thing with the blue. So this region will pair here, and this region will hybridize with Watson Crick base pairing over here. So the blue one will also staple the scaffold. And by throwing in staple oligonucleotides to cover all the bases of the scaffold molecule, we can fold the entire scaffold together into compact DNA shapes, three-dimensional shapes, with the shape is determined only by the sequence of the oligonucleotides that we add. And usually we depict these objects using cylinders as a representation of each DNA double helix. So in this case, we have a six helix bundle nanotube. And our work on three-dimensional DNA origami is described in this paper from 2009. Uh, uh, this figure shows some transmission electron micrographs from that paper uh, that we produced for that study. And the scale bars here are 20 nanometers. So as you can see, we have the power to create some pretty interesting and complex shapes. OK, so back to the topic at hand here. How can we tune DNA origami designs so that they work better than just normal double-stranded DNA for delivery of doxorubicin, for example? So I'm going to show you that by making twisted nanotubes, we can actually load more drug and release it over a longer period of time. So let me show you how that works. I'm going to have to go a little bit into the detail of how we construct these objects, so bear with me. So normally when we design DNA origami objects, we use the fact that the strands in double-stranded DNA, in its common B form, that the strands takes almost exactly 10.5 bases to wind its way one complete turn around its complement. And this here is crystallography data of six base pairs of normal double-stranded DNA. And let's look at the ball and stick model to the left here. So because the DNA takes 10.5 bases to make a turn, if we go 21 bases, with the DNA will have taken exactly two turns. So in designing DNA origami, we use this fact to create so-called crossovers. So these are crossover points you can see here and here. So if you make a crossover here, this strand is jumping over to this helix, from this helix to this helix, this strand jumping over here, which means that 21 base pairs away, it's in perfect position to jump back again to create these two sort of glue points between the double helices. So if you look at the six helix bundle from a few slides ago, you can see that all the strands in our structures form crossovers between neighboring helices. And the same thing here, if this is a good point to jump over to bind these helices together, this is also a good point 21 base pairs away. OK. That was normal uh, double-stranded DNA. So doxorubicin intercalates DNA, and it is known to deform the DNA structure locally. So let's have a look at DNA intercalated with dox. So this here is crystallography data from Frederick et al. Uh, showing DNA intercalated with dox. And this model here is to scale with the previous model. Uh, as you can see, it turns out that doxorubicin appears to change the DNA twist and appears to elongate the DNA and make it thinner. It also, also note that if we would use the normal 21 base pairs per turn, we would cross over somewhere here, which wouldn't really work. So we need to go 24 bases to make two full turns or to make a design that has 12 base pairs per turn. So in my lab, we made some new DNA origami structures. We designed a tube of 18 parallel helices, so a nanotube of about 140 nanometers in, uh, in length. But instead of using the normal 10.5 base pairs per turn strategy, we designed it to have 12 bases per turn. And after looking at these structures under the transmission electron microscope, we noticed that they displayed a very twisted look. And this was actually expected. And to the left here, I'm showing you a simulation from a software from Mark Bathe's lab at MIT. Um, that predicts DNA origami designs. It's called CANDU. And because we used the 12 base pairs per turn design paradigm, but we didn't actually add any drug, so this DNA still wants to be in this way, uh, the DNA uh, is very frustrated and we see this twisted appearance. So after incubating the structures with doxorubicin, the structures relax and assumes this restrator and longer shape. The scale bars here are 100 nanometers. So we were hoping uh, 
that because of the way we design our structures, our twisted door DNA origamis, using this 12 base pairs per turn design paradigm, uh, that since it's relaxing when, it, uh, when DOX binds, that it would actually bind DOX rubicin harder and makes the DOX stick with higher affinity and maybe even load more drug. And indeed, it turns out that that is the case. So here we use a common assay to evaluate the in vitro release kinetics. And the in vitro release kinetics shows us that DNA, normal straight DNA origami, and double-stranded DNA, this, this blue curve is plasmid DNA, and this is normal straight DNA origami, show very similar release uh, and quite fast release kinetics. But our twisted designs, however, the ones with 12 base pairs per turn, showed a slower release with more than 50% of the doxorubicin still bound after several hours. So as Professor Barnhold said in his talk, getting uh, the release right is a big part of the problem. And here I'm showing you, I want to emphasize that, that we're actually tuning this ra by rational design. So these two structures contain the exact same amount of DNA. It's the same, same kind of chemical structure. The only thing that we have changed is the design of the oligonucleotides that builds up the entire structure. So here's some data on the cytotoxicity. And three different breast cancer cell lines were exposed to the DOX nanotube system. And as you can see, cell growth is inhibited more efficiently than using the free drug. And in, in, in this pane here, you can see that in all cases we get a significant decrease in the half maximum inhibitory concentration when using the twisted nanotube. So we further examined the internalization of our structures of the drug. At the top here, I show you confocal images uh, of free drug and the DOX nanotube system, and this is MDA MB231 cells exposed to free DOX and the twisted nanostructure for two hours. So in the case of the nanostructure complex, we also labeled the olig one oligonucleotide, and you can see that in this pane here. So it appears that the structures get internalized by the cells. And to quantitatively investigate how the cells accumulate doxorubicin, uh, we, we exposed the cells to, to this for two hours or half an hour. And you can see when we use the free drug, after half an hour or two hours, it seems like uh, the cells contain much more doxorubicin when we use the free drug. But if we then wash away all the drug or the drug complexes and then let the cells continue to grow for 12 or 24 hours, we see that actually after that period of time, it's significantly more doxorubicin in the cells that were exposed to the nanostructure system. So we don't really know exactly the uptake mechanism at this point, and more research needs to be done before we can nail that down. But it appears that our DNA origami structures, looking at, at this data, that they form some kind of local drug depots, possibly in endosomes, where they continue to re release the drug over a longer period of time, where the cells have difficulty exposing on that. And of course, this is a first set of experiments, but because we now have the flexibility of, uh, of the DNA origami method at our disposal, uh, I believe that this will allow us to easily tune the, the, and optimize the properties of the system, like in the example I showed you before with the release rate. So <clears throat> to conclude, I hope I have convinced you that by using DNA nanotechnology, we now have a new toolbox to make efficient uh, delivery devices for drugs. And in particular, I hope that uh, this example from my lab, where we use the power of molecular design using DNA origami to tune the delivery rate of doxorubicin, has provided you with, with some inf inspiration. And it's my belief that applications such as this one, for example, or the ones that I showed at the start of my presentation, uh, forms the beginning of a new fruitful branch of, of nanomedicine. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. This, a lot of this work was performed by my former postdoc, Yongqing Zhao. Thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot for introducing us into this topic. Uh, we have one sh allowance for one short question because we don't want to postpone the break further. Yeah. Ah. I'm the only volunteer. <laughs> Can you show the slides again? All of them? No, 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 no. Just the one, <laughs> the one of the cytotoxicity. I love them, but the one of them. The, the cytotoxicity, yeah.
<laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, you know, uh, I think it, first of all, your work is fascinating. I really, I think it's fascinating. I'm involved a little bit just by hearing with Itamar Wilner in our uh, university. And uh, I know a little <coughs> bit about it, and I think it's, it's really state of the art, I think. But regarding this, I think this is a very important slide. Actually, it will show that when you go in vivo, your system will not work at all. In vitro or in, in vivo? In vivo, okay, yeah. Okay, and the reason is the following. Uh, you know, if we base doxyl development on the testing in vitro, we'll, we'll not have doxyl today because doxyl work very poorly. Cytotoxicity almost doesn't exist. Very, very low. Two order of magnitude lower, even mm -hmm. less. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it doesn't release the drug. When it doesn't release the drug, when you inject it, the drug will be uh, still associated with your carrier for a long time, and when it goes to the tumor site, with the help of whatever, the drug will be released and you get the efficacy. <coughs> so if you take a system like that, and, and it means that in vitro you get a, a release of drug, and this drug is, is effective, <coughs> the, the, the problem is that you may uh, lose uh, your efficacy in vivo. So I think so you think you need a burst release? Is that what you you're saying? You don't need a burst. You don't need a burst. Okay. You don't need a release, as a matter of fact, in vitro. It's better mm -hmm. not to have a release in vitro. Mm -hmm. Very, very little release in vitro. So <clears throat> I was thinking about, uh, I mean, wouldn't it be a possibility to combine the two, to have a liposomal... Uh, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I think... Because then we can tune okay. the release rate using think, this core. Yeah, I think it's core. a fascinating system. Something to protect the liposome while it circulates, you definitely need. Then there is other question, and I'm not really expert in this, but you, you have to check into it. You know, DNA uh, is immunogenic. Yeah, actually it's been in, in this mouse study that I talked about, uh, where they used uh, uh, the, the, the plasma DNA, they actually see that as an advantage. So they, they measure elevated uh, levels of cytokines in their mice. Uh, which I guess we would see the same effect, and they, they, they say that in this case, for the anti-tumor therapy, that actually advantages. But. I, I, well, I don't want to say that. Okay. I think it goes by scavengers. What happens when you inject it second time, and you're never enough to inject once, any chemo, inject it once, it's not serious. Then, then, then you can either keep the animal from the cytokine storm, or the system will not work because there are such high levels of antibodies But just another challenge to be solved. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would suggest that the two of you should definitely continue discussion about this. Um, but for the while, uh, thank you again, Bjorn.